When I was just a young mom with three small children under five, a friend of mine invited me to go to a community ecumenical Bible study. Now, when you have three small children, things are bound to happen to disrupt your daily plans, like, like an illness, like a fishbowl getting knocked over, like a small child being too tired and needing a nap. So I didn't actually go with her that first time to the Bible study. But thank goodness that she kept inviting, and she kept inviting, and she kept inviting me. Because eventually, it was that Bible study that transformed me into a disciple. Now, don't get me wrong, I, was all, I would have already called myself a Christian. I believed in Jesus. I went to church regularly. But I wasn't yet a disciple, one who walks so closely with Jesus that you actually can taste the dust stirred up by his footsteps. That Wednesday morning group gave me a safe place to work through my questions and through my doubts, to wrestle with scripture at my own pace, but yet in a support of other people. And those friends came alongside of me when life's challenges threatened to derail me. That loving, safe, supportive environment is what opened my mind, opened my heart, opened my hands to a deep and lasting relationship with Jesus. The friends from this community were classified as faith sisters. Our lives are also peppered with faith resistors. For example, you've had a long week. You are tired. You are bone tired. But the morning sun is starting to slice between that gap between your blinds and dance on your bedroom walls. And as you raise yourself up and look at the bedroom clock, you realize that if you get up right now, you'll have time for both coffee and breakfast before you go to church. But your spouse, being awakened by your restlessness, reaches over and grabs you in a tender embrace and whispers in your ear, just stay with me in this warm bed and let's go back to sleep for an hour. Faith resistor. <laughs> <laughs> sneaks up on us. It doesn't always come in direct opposition to God, so it's easier to give in to. For example, work is good and it's necessary to support our family, but it can suck the life out of us and take away from our time so much that we can't get to church. We can't even have time for personal devotionals. Sports is a great release of energy, but what do you choose to participate in when the game is scheduled at the same time as worship. Our bodies need rest and recreation, but our souls also need to be fed. We need time to draw close to our Lord and find God's healing peace. Today's scripture paints a picture of some faith resistors, people we would normally have classified as faith assisters. This is the story in which the disciples are the resistors. Jesus and his disciples have been up in the area of Caesarea of Philippi, and they've left that area and come back to Galilee, a place where the news of Jesus' ministry of health and healing is already spread, and so the people are starting to seek him out. The people are coming for teaching, and the Pharisees are coming to challenge Jesus, and parents are bringing their children to Jesus so that he will lay hands on them. Jesus is often criticized for spending time with the wrong people, the tax collectors, and the sinners, and even little children, instead of spending time with the right people, the key leaders who could advance 
his message into the political world. But here we see the people bringing their children to Jesus and the disciples rebu rebuking them, pushing them away, shielding Jesus from them, separating them, keeping them away. Now you'd think that the disciples would know better because just a short time ago, chapter 9, verse 36, they were arguing about who was going to be Jesus' right-hand man. And he took up a child into his arms. And he said, whoever embraces one of these children, as I do, embraces me, and far more than me, embraces God. During this silly argument about who was going to be the greatest, who had the highest status, who had the most honor. He picked up a child, the one individual around who had the least status and honor, and said that this little one was the key to God's kingdom, the key to God's embrace. Now I'm not really sure if the disciples were really that dense, or whether Mark was just a really good author and is using the disciples' failure to comprehend as a rhetorical tool so that we have a better chance of understanding. But the disciples still don't see that everyone has value to Jesus. And so they shoo away the parents and children. Jesus is indignant. He is incensed. Jesus is irate and he shouts, These children are the very center of the kingdom. Unless you accept God's kingdom in the simplicity of a child, you are never going to get in. And then gathering the children into his arms, he blessed each one. Folks, each of us is a child of God. Each of us would be welcomed into Jesus' embrace, and Jesus would become indignant, incensed, and irate if anyone tried to come between us and him. As followers of Christ, we both have received both a gift and a responsibility. Our gift is being that blessed child of God. And our responsibility is to be a blessing to others and to welcome them into the kingdom too. So how do we do that? Last Tuesday, many folks gathered to eat pancakes and sausage. And the fellowship hall was full of laughter and good smells and hugs and handshakes as we welcomed people from the greater community who we hadn't seen for a while. What moved me most was watching Laura cradle three-week-old Kyle as his parents Aaron and Sherry looked on. It was a kingdom moment for me, not only because Kyle is as precious as can be, but because I could see the relationship between the Basiglios and the Fosters. It was tangible. I could <coughs> feel that powerful connection that had been woven out of time and life experiences. <coughs> life experiences that are joyful like a new baby and life experiences that are much sadder like the loss of a parent or grandparent. When Reverend Vicki Starnes was here last week, she talked about change, adaptive change, and she taught us that the season of the church being the center of people's social lives has passed. And that we need to take some of our past core strengths and build a new way of being church in this day and age. So when I remember that scene from Pancake Tuesday, I, I consider how can we build on that strength and what is blocking us? What's being a faith resistor in our community? Where can we find faith assisters? 
how has the church become isolated from the culture around us, from the movies and the music, and how can we plug back into that culture? Are we seen as elitist and exclusive in a society that is pluralistic and multicultural? How do we invite people to see that our worship is not boring, that our preaching is rational and relevant? How do we create a worship in today's culture in which God is truly, truly felt to be present? How can we change the perception that the church is out of sync with scientific advances? And how can we create a safe place here where people can wrestle with their questions and their doubts? How do we welcome every child of God and bless them? We continue to draw on the strengths of our past to build a new future. Laura says that she was shaped by growing up in this church family. She was kind of reluctant to use that phrase that a whole village raises a child because it feels trite. And to her, it was truly this group of people that shaped her life. For her, Delmont is a safe place full of familiar smiles and welcoming faces and fond memories. A place where she and the other members of that legendary youth group ate pancakes, served pancakes, washed dishes, and got yelled at for horsing around. Somehow for Laura, the church has become more than a program or a social role or an obligation. It has become the body of Christ that raised her. It has become Jesus' embrace and blessing. She says that if our children, if Kirsten and Jeffrey and Trey and Gracie and her friend and her brothers, Tyler and Jeremy, who aren't here today, if they could know a fraction of the power of that kind of peer-oriented system, she would be grateful, and so would I. And I would go on to say that if the other members of that legendary youth group could also say that Delmont was a place that they grew in their faith, or rather, a place that they continue to grow in their faith, I would be grateful. So we will continue to reach out using every type of technology possible to change the faulty perceptions of who we are. And we will be aware of the culture around us and plug into that culture to continue to tell the stories of Jesus. And we will continue to be a welcoming place where there is a pervasive sense of the Lord so that each member here feels that we've got your back when life is tough. We will create adaptive changes that will help people become disciples of Jesus and make a difference in our wider community. Now, it may be that a new youth group evolves out of the journey that the youth will be making in the next six weeks. It may be that people find a safe place to struggle with their questions and doubts at our TV dinners. It may be that people's faith will deepen as they work with us on mission projects. But what, however it comes to look here at Delmont, we will continue to evolve and be a vital congregation, always ready to serve and show what God's love looks like in our world. I'd really like to end on a much lighter note. So I'm going to end with some humor. Many people have excuses for not attending church each week, but if you were to turn those excuses around and apply them to other things we do, for example, like eating, those excuses might look like this. I don't want to eat because I was forced to eat as a child. 
People who eat all the time are hypocrites. They're not really that hungry. There are so many different kinds of food, I can't really decide which one to eat. I used to eat, but I got bored and stopped all that. I only eat on special occasions like Easter and Christmas. None of my friends will come here to eat with me. I'll start eating when I get older. I don't really have time to eat anymore. I don't believe that eating does anybody any good. It's just a crutch. And the number one excuse for not eating, restaurants and grocery stores are only after your money. Seriously. Friendships fade if we don't make intentional efforts to maintain them. And without intentional effort, our relationship with God can fade too. Oh, God will keep on calling, but will we pick up and will we listen? God will keep on reaching out to embrace us, but will we walk into God's arms? Sometimes it takes multiple invitations to it brings someone into a friendship or to bring them into a relationship with Jesus. So let's continue to invite people into God's realm. Let's welcome them like Jesus welcomed all the little children. Amen? Amen. Amen.